here we are, one week away from our 2022 edition of our Direct Air Capture Summit. We're really excited to host this event for the third year in a row and we're looking forward to welcoming you all there. Our industry is growing at a rapid pace. Last year has seen a watershed moment of carbon removal with an increased focus on direct air capture. The IPCC described carbon removal as essential and the industry has seen rapidly growing support from business leaders, policy shapers around the world. Ahead of discussing this rapid ascension in more detail, we are excited to release this video and I want to thank warmly all those key players who have contributed and participated. From Climeworks side, last year was a very exciting one. Last September, when we last met, we had just launched Orca, the world's first commercial direct air capture and storage plant. Since then, we have received increased trust from corporate customers having completed deals with BCG, LGT, Ocado and Block. And in April, we signed a new equity financing round at a volume of 650 million US dollar, gathering the support of several of the most renowned and largest institutional technology and infrastructure investors worldwide. Next week, we'll talk a bit more about what the future holds for us and what are the next steps on our scale-up roadmap. For now, I'll hand over to Professor Gabriel Walker, where next week she'll deliver a keynote on stage at the summit. In the meantime, she provides a bit more context about the industry of carbon removals and here introduces exciting developments that these key players have been focusing on. Hello, I'm Gabrielle Walker, and I'm the founder of Valence Solutions and Rethinking Removals, which focus on accelerating the fight against climate change and scaling high quality carbon removals. We do both of these because as the IPCC put it in April this year, carbon removals are now unavoidable. Alongside very rapid reduction in emissions, we have to have high quality carbon removals at scale to give us any chance of getting down to net zero fast enough to stop the worst effects of climate change. A direct air capture is a key part of this mix. And on June the 30th, I'll be speaking at Climeworks Direct Air Capture Summit, an event designed to bring the industry together. Ahead of this, I'm happy to present an overview of some of the companies leading the way in direct air capture. In this video, they'll introduce themselves and describe in detail what they've been working on and how they're bringing their projects to life to get carbon removals to the quality and scale that we need. I hope you enjoy the video. Hi everyone, I'm Shashank. I'm CEO at Heirloom. We're a directory capture company that uses carbon mineralization to pull carbon out of the air. Super excited to be here. Um, thank you, Climeworks, for hosting and so before I get into how heirlooms process works, uh, technology works, I want to quickly give you a background about how we came about uh, and, and a little bit of my personal history. So, you know, I, I moved to, to the US uh, from India. I grew up in Southeast India where I saw firsthand uh, impacts of climate change on very vulnerable people, uh, people who had little to do with creating the problem in the first place, uh, you know, heat waves and cyclones and, and, and droughts and so forth. And, you know, I always wanted to work on climate and, you know, until 2018, an IPCC report, uh, I couldn't really figure out how to, um, you know, as, as you guys know, the IPCC report really talked about for the first time, you know, the world's best scientists working on climate, uh, that we need a lot of carbon removal in addition to reducing emissions and decarbonizing the entire economy. And, you know, that was both scary, uh, but also, uh, and, and, inspiring at the same time. It's a, it's a very clear problem that we need to, that we need to solve. And uh, I, that sort of took me on a journey. Uh, at the time, I was uh, building a company. Uh, I co-founded co a company called Tempo, which basically uses robotics and software to make manufacturing process much, much faster uh, to help electrical engineers pr rapidly prototype their designs. Uh, and you know, I was looking to see how, how can I uh, bring my experience in entrepreneurship and, and, and building technology companies to helping with carbon removal. And, you know, everything sort of surrounded uh, around this one mission. Um, you know, there's lots of ways to remove carbon uh, out of the air and uh, lots of different approaches, but 
you know, this is sort of the really the, the big problem statement. How do you remove a billion tons of CO2 per, per year from the atmosphere by 2035? You know, this is really what's needed to, to get to uh, you know, net, net zero by 2050. So, you know, and, and, and this is sort of a, a, a galvanizing statement uh, and, and really filters out a lot of different ways to, to approach this problem. And you know, eventually, I talked to maybe you know twenty to three, uh, thirty different researchers and scientists working in the field. Uh, you know, everyone from coastal blue carbon to uh, direct air capture to carbon mineralization to ocean uh, CDR. And you know, I, I wasn't quite convinced that any one of those approaches would be low cost or scalable or you know permanent, verifiable, quantifiable, additional. And you know, finally, I, I met a group that I was re really super excited by. And uh, you know, there were Jen Wilcox, um, uh, who is currently at the Department of Energy, Peter Kellerman, uh, who's been doing a lot of work on carbon mineralization, uh, as well as Phil Renforth, uh, Noah, and Greg, uh, who have bring expertise in direct air capture and mineralization. And you know, the the thing that I was super excited by was combining the best of direct air capture, which was you know, incredibly engineered and, and, and had a high, high cost to it. And mineralization, which was lower cost, uh, but had issues with verifiability and land use. So, you know, we asked ourselves, like, can we bring the best of both worlds? And, you know, that's what Heirloom ended up being. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how the technology works. Currently, the team is about uh, 40, 45 folks or so. And, you know, and, and, the, and the team comes from, industrial automation, uh, building and scaling technology companies, and also, uh, you know, lots of research uh, in, in carbon removal. And, you know, a lot, lot of the leaders and, and folks have done this before, and we are super excited to apply our talents to, to scaling uh, carbon, uh, carbon removal. So how this works is we start with uh, a carbonate. And, and the carbonate, you may think, you know, limestone, magnesium carbonate, so limestone uh, specifically, there, it's incredibly abundant in the Earth's crust. Uh, it's you know, over geological timeframes, limestone has pulled CO2 out of the air to help maintain the carbon balance uh, of, of the atmosphere. And you know, there's trillions of tons of, of this stuff in the Earth's crust. Uh, the problem with you know, using minerals to pull CO2 out of the air is that they're kind of slow. Uh, you know, but if you can figure out how to accelerate the carbon uptake rate of these minerals, you can really have a low cost, scalable direct air capture process. So, so the, yeah, the entire technology starts with these minerals. And the way it works is you start with these minerals and then you put them into an electric kiln. And this is basically where most of our cost goes to, uh, the, the energy and the capex associated with, with the electric kiln process. So the ele electric kiln, is driven by renewable, renewable electricity. Um, it's, it's modular uh, and, and, we, we, and it can be run by renewables. And what, what that does is it heats up this carbonate, uh, the limestone into two things. A CO2, pure CO2 carbon dioxide uh, that we can store underground geologically permanently. Uh, and then the other thing it does, it produces an oxide, uh, calcium oxide. And this calcium oxide coming out of the kiln is very reactive for CO2. You know, it, it likes to pull CO2 molecules out of the air. Why? Because we put in a bunch of energy uh, to break it apart from CO2. So it wants to bind with that CO2 again. Uh, so you know, if you put that oxide on your desk, it, it pulls up CO2 molecules. The problem is that it would take over a year to sufficient, sufficiently saturate itself with the CO2 from the air. What we've done over the last couple of years is to accelerate that carbon uptake rates. So now it's under three days, right? It's about a hundred x acceleration uh, than than what it would do naturally. And this acceleration is so important because it means that we can use a lot less capex, lot less contactors, lot less oxide to capture the same amount of CO two. And in that, this acceleration is really what makes the economics work. Um, you know, it's, we still don't use any forced airflow. You know, basically the way it looks is that it's sort of like a baking rack. Uh, we take these oxides, we spread them out on these on trays, sort of like a baking tray, and we stack these baking trays on top of each other, uh, so in, in a baking rack, if you will. These are much taller. Uh, they, 
they expand the surface area with which these oxides are exposed to the air. And, you know, and the wind replenishes the CO2. The wind uh, essentially acts as our contactor, uh, as, acts as our airflow. And these oxides pull up that CO2 um, as the wind brings it. And it would take about a few days to, to fully carbonate and it becomes a carbonate, which is exactly what you started with. So we can reuse that carbonate over and over again in, in a cyclic process. And you know, we don't have to mine more. It's a closed loop process. And we've shown uh, through, through research that uh, we, we haven't really seen much degradation, uh, really any, deg any degradation uh, per cycle yet. Uh, so we think we can reuse these carbonates uh, many, many times. Um, so yeah, so how does this, the heirloom process look like? Uh, you know, if you walk into an heirloom site, the way it looks like is you have a bunch of these contactors, um, these racks, if you will, which have a bunch of trays, you know, hundreds of them stacked on top of each other. And then, uh, and then you, you know, it's, it's modular. So you can basically increase the throughput by making a lot of these racks next to each other. Uh, and then you, you see a bunch of electric kilns uh, near these contactors that regenerate the oxide um, to pull up more CO2. So, you know, why does this get to low cost uh, and, and quickly, not, 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 you know, we don't have all the time in the world. We, we need to get to billion tons by 2035. So, you know, we picked this process really because it's very simple, right? We use abundant minerals, limestone, uh, to, to pull CO2, to, to, act our, to act as a sponge for the CO2. And simplicity is a big deal, right? Um, there, there are no extra points for over-engineering. Uh, and, you know, simplicity means low cost, it, it means scalable. Um, and, you know, we really believe that simplifying the process to pull CO2 is, is, is a way to go. Um, and it's modular, uh, it means we can mass produce them in a factory um, and, and, and allow for a linear and, and uh, exponential adoption uh, of these contactors. And the technical maturity is, is fairly high. Uh, we are using, you know, industrial automation technologies to, to, to expose a lot of the surface area. And, you know, we can borrow a lot, of, a lot from automotive manufacturing, agriculture mining and warehouse automation uh, to, uh, to, to and, and bring them closer together. And so it's really more of an integration risk and an engineering risk instead of a science risk. Um, so where are we today? Uh, last few years, we've been focused on the accelerating that carbon uptake uh, I talked about going from a, about a year to three days. And in parallel, we've also been scaling up our prototypes of these contactors. So we've been building larger and larger prototypes uh, of, of these racks. Uh, of these contactors, and we are accelerating towards our first deployment next year. Uh, so that will show the, the modular and the scalable nature of, of this technology and at a, at a meaningful scale. Uh, a billion tons per year uh, it sounds ambitious, and it is, but it is reasonable. Uh, it, it, it is achievable. Um, and you know, I think if you get to about a million tons within the, in the late 2020s, uh, we can get to that million ten mark in, 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 the, in the 2030s. And you know it's gonna this is one of the most ambitious things humanity has ever tried to do. Um, and it, will, it won't be easy, but I think it is achievable. Um, and this is what we really need to do, humanity needs to do to get to net zero by 2050. Um, recently, we've uh, announced our series A of $53 million and that really got unlocked by our, uh, our breakthrough in carbonation rate getting down to three days that makes this economics work, um, you know, so that eventually we can be between 50 to hundred bucks a ton uh, to remove CO2 out of the air. And it's led by Carbon Direct, Aaron and Breakthrough Energy Ventures uh, and also participation from Microsoft, uh, Low Carbon um, and uh, many other folks. So super exciting to uh, get a lot more capital to parallel uh, parallelize our both our research and also our deployments. We also uh, recently announced that we received an X Prize uh, Malston Award along with Carfix. Uh, super exciting! Uh, uh, you know, Carfix uses a process to sequester CO two underground using mineralization, and we use mineralization to pull CO two out of the air over the ground. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, marriage and we're really <laughs> betting on mineralization that, uh, as, as a way to uh, capture and, and store CO2. We're super excited to have many uh, customers, uh, some of the largest carbon removal, carbon removal purchasers in, in the world, 
uh, Stripe, Shopify, Klarna, and, and a bunch of other folks. Uh, you know, there's a few others we haven't announced yet, but uh, thank you uh, all these customers for, for the support uh, to help bring us down the cost curve. So we're looking at uh, for a few things uh, and, and we're moving very quickly and we're hiring across the company uh, for commercialization, engineering, research. Uh, please look at our jobs page. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, we're based in San Francisco and uh, there's probably something that uh, you can help with. So yeah, please look at our jobs, jobs page. Uh, we're also looking for a few, few things to help with their deployment, um, you know, renewable energy partners and injection partners for CO2 and also host sites. Uh, we're always looking to talk to more partners uh, and to help um, plan our deployments. We are currently focused in the US, but we are always open to nationally as well. And you know, if you have any questions, if you, uh, and if you wanna reach out, we are at air, hello at heirloomcarbon.com. Uh, and yeah, super exciting to share our story. Uh, thank you, Climeworks, for the opportunity. Hello, I'm Adrian Corliss. I'm the CEO of Carbon Capture Inc. And I'm really uh, pleased to have the chance to introduce you to the company. So first of all, I'm just gonna quickly run through some fast facts about Carbon Capture Inc. So first of all, we're a Los Angeles-based company that was founded out of Idea Lab by Bill Gross in 2019. So two big parts of our business. First of all, we're a direct air capture technology developer. And secondly, we're a, a direct air capture project developer as well. And so, you know, that's key in terms of our outward customer facing focus on uh, creating and selling carbon removal credits. Uh, so our focus primarily is on North America. And uh, as an organization, we're, we're targeting uh, the sale of first removal credits in 2023. So a little bit about our technology platform. So we're developing a very flexible cyclic process for capturing CO2 from ambient air. Uh, it's modular and, uh, and importantly, it's a sorbent based platform. So we're, we're, we're work, working on and developing material science uh, to enable the capture. Uh, by being modular, it allows us to manufacture our products off-site and then deploy them uh, at scale uh, at the project site. Um, it's important because it allows us to focus initially on small initial deployments, and it's really about technology de-risking and, and also about demonstrating the actual business and the generation uh, of revenues early on before we scale up. But being modular, there's no limit to our ability to scale up. And so, you know, our, our goal is to, is to land small projects starting in 2023, but then to expand them to megaton capacity uh, over the next five to eight years. And so this idea of being able to, again, have projects that are by definition scalable as our initial starting points allows us to avoid some of the dangers of, of being just too project focused and chasing projects. So that's a key part to how we're approaching the market. Uh, and the second, which is key, is that you know we're sorbent-based cyclic process, so that's that's not uncommon. But I think what's a little bit different is that the degree to which we're focusing on uh, the development of partnerships with a number of different sorbent providers, and so we think that that's key for a number of reasons. First of all, it allows us to uh, again be working on sorbents that you know are at different stages of development uh, because certainly there are a class of sorbents available today but there is a lot happening in the market in terms of uh, DAC specific sorbents that uh, this is work that wasn't happening five years ago and it also allows us to be more resilient in terms of supply chain disruption so we're looking at developing a platform that has you know we call it interoperable the ability to use different uh, different sorbents that fall within certain classes in the same machine. Um, and the other thing is it allows us to think about so tuning sorbents to different climates and markets. And, and again, we're learning again, I think, as, as a lot of the industry is, is that, you know, one particular sorbent may not be suitable for all particular environmental applications. So I think um, the other thing I think is, is important, and, and again, I've been involved in the direct air capture space now for more than a decade. And what's happened in the last 12 to 18 months is, is different. And, and I think there's three key things that are, that are sort of converging in the last 18 months, which is really driving the direct air capture market forward in a way that, that just wasn't possible uh, a few years ago. And the first is, I think this growing public recognition of the imperative to achieve net zero by 2050. And you know that's sort of a, a cumulative 100 gigatons by 2050 um, and, and around 10 tons of, of CDR by that same date. And so, so I think, again, that's no longer in question. 
Uh, the second is, again, you know, sort of sticking with the U.S. focus is that there's been significant U.S. engagement uh, around the support of direct air capture at scale, and that includes things like the direct air capture hub program, which is three and a half billion dollars, and then a number of other programs around prizes, uh, some, some work specific to CO2 infrastructure, and then also some regulatory frameworks like California low carbon fuel standards and tax incentives like the 45Q program, which allow for, again, a, a growing market and a, and, a, and a reliable source of revenue for, for direct air capture. Um, and the third, which is absolutely the most important, which is again, really a, a new, I would say a new thing in the last 18 months is that customers are stepping up and, and signaling a willingness to actually pay for carbon removal. And I think just to sort of emphasize that point, a couple of things. One is, is that you know, over 700 of the world's largest public companies now have made specific commitments to achieve net zero you know, in timeframes between 2035 and 2050. And so what's really happening here is that business is actually taking on a leadership role uh, in support of carbon removal and carbon removal businesses. So that's, that's, that's key. And I think the next graphic is, is quite telling, which is really looking at what's happened you know, from 2020 to 2022, you see this rapid growth in commitments by large corporations to actually step in and take an early stand in terms of support of carbon removal technologies. And a lot of these are very specific to engineered carbon removal technologies versus, versus biological ones. And so again, even as, you know, as, as recent as, as uh, the Davos conference last uh, week, uh, we saw another approximately a billion dollars in commitments show up again, that are companies from different different types of companies and also companies from different uh, ge geographies around the world. So this is again, key to the fact that direct air capture now has a market to grow into. So what are we doing? I mean, really what we're focused on, again, outside of being at the technology development, of course, is, is to develop a commercial scale, US-based carbon removal as a service business. Um, and what that means to us is, is A, you know, we're, we're, we're customer facing, uh, we're selling direct air capture carbon removal credits and allowing us also to, to collect the 45Q credits. Uh, we're working with partners to develop projects on geological sequestration. So in the U.S., the Class Six wells are 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 you know they're it's it's an, it, they're not plentiful, but there are a few regions where we're seeing that uh, we should have Class Six wells available for sequestration in the next twelve months. And then secondly, mineralization, and you know that's that, that's you know I think a, another approach to to permanent geological sequestration that uh, it gains traction. I think also a great public acceptance because of the permanent permanency and the lack of need to monitor after a couple of years. Um, in order to be effective, all of our, all of our systems are, are powered by zero emission energy and we're, you know, each of our projects have um, a, an adjacent project related to, to energy. And last is, again, it's, it's basically working with our sequestration partners to, 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 to ensure the, the measurability and verifiability and the permanence of, uh, of the removal that's happening. So that's where we're starting, um, but I think it's not, you know, it's important not to forget that to get to net zero carbon removal is, is a part of that equation, but there's another part of that equation, which is really about emissions reduction or substitution of fossil carbon for recycled carbon. In that sense, you know, we believe that the use of direct air capture for synthet synthetic fuels will eventually be as big or bigger than the carbon removal opportunities for direct air capture. So again, you know, to, in order for synthetic fuels to work and to be part of the, uh, the long-term solution, they need, to, they need to source CO2 from non-fossil sources and, and they need to do it at scale. And, and DAC is probably the only scalable alternative. Um, and so what we're doing there again is, is developing a series of technology partnerships along that value chain. And we're targeting initial small scale deployment of, of a synthetic fuels project in 2025. So that's, that's where we're going. So I think again, I just want to thank um, thank uh, thank everyone for the opportunity to, to introduce the company, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing everybody at the DAC Summit uh, in a few weeks. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Josh Santos, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Noya. At Noya, we're turning cooling towers into carbon vacuums. I started working on Noya about two years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic, after living through the wildfires of California and the growing intensity of hurricanes in the Southeast as a kid, I wanted to take those experiences and do everything that I could to prevent future people from having to go through them. And so I started Noya. At Noya, we're on a mission to accelerate the world's transition to carbon negativity. Now, 
Uh, we've been able to build up an amazing team so far to come and support us on this mission. My background's in uh, EVs and chemical engineering. My co-founder Daniel's background is in building cool components for mechanical engineering projects and moonshot projects as well. And we've been able to build up a great team of early uh, team members to support our work, including some people who have hyper growth experience at tech startups in San Francisco, people who have experience in building and designing large scale manufacturing and pilot processes, and people that have run big processes as well. So we've got a rock star team that's working on getting us to this mission that we're working towards. Now, we're, all, we're talking about here uh, pulling CO2 out of the air, which is referred to as direct air capture. And, and uh, many direct air capture approaches have large CapEx requirements. Um, large scale direct air capture is a critically important tool for us to remove the amount of carbon dioxide that we need to from the atmosphere. Um, but at the rate that we need to start designing these processes and start pulling CO2 out of the air, um, it can be challenging to overcome the large upfront CapEx requirements and the long, the long installation time requirements as well. Um, and so when we started working on this company two years ago in our garage here in San Francisco, <clears throat> we were thinking about how we can shortcut both the CapEx requirements and the installation time requirements. That's been our North Star. And so that's, that's basically guided us to what we're doing now. Today, what we're building is a capitally efficient, quick to deploy direct air capture process. Our approach happens in three steps. First, we retrofit existing cooling towers where they are right now, uh, starting with commercial buildings and moving up from there. We then transport the CO2 that's captured from these cooling towers to regional carbon removal facilities. And finally, we remove captured CO2 using available types of technology. So I'll walk through these in, in, in sequence to start. And to start, we turn these cooling towers into carbon vacuums. Um, there are 2 million cooling towers in the US alone that have been constructed. And, uh, and you can basically think about them. If you've never seen one, there's one here on the left. You can basically think about them as a big box that has a huge fan that moves lots of air. We built a lot of them because they're really great at cooling down different, uh, different industrial processes that, uh, that we are operating. And so we're taking advantage of the spent capital, the spent energy to move air and using it to capture CO2 with our process. Our process consists of a few key steps here. We have uh, <clears throat> essentially uh, uh, this unit here is our contactor where we add our solid CO2 capture sorbent that is responsible for performing the carbon capture. As air flows into the cooling tower, the air first passes through our equipment and the CO2 in that air binds to the surface of our material where it stays behind. We then take that material that now has uh, CO2 bound to the surface and we, um, we move it into a separate regeneration device. This regeneration device adds in heat so that uh, we can liberate the captured CO2 and regenerate the sorbent in its initial form. <clears throat> we send the sorbent back to our contactor to capture more CO2. And uh, the CO2 that is liberated, we collect on site. So with this simple slim profile retrofit, we're able to convert every single cooling tower in the world to a carbon vacuum. The next step is to come around and get the captured CO2. And so that's what we do. Many uh, buildings or industrial facilities already have existing workflows that they're used to for waste management, right? They have companies come around with trucks to pick up trash from their facility. And so we slot into those existing workflows with similarly sized pieces of uh, transportation equipment and come around and pick up CO2 where it's produced. We move it from uh, the production site where the cooling tower sits to a to a central processing facility that allows us to, uh, to, to, to prepare the CO2 for long haul transport. And, um, and these transportation distances that we're talking about here are short enough that we can use electrified trucking uh, to keep our carbon impact for this part of our process low and, uh, and, and make it something that is, that is easy to, to handle. So we come around after producing the CO2 and we move it. 
and uh, we move it to sequestration facilities that we find distributed all around the world and, and especially around the US. This map here is a map uh, put out by the Department of Energy here in the US that overlays um, potential carbon sequestration opportunities on the one hand with uh, future commercial sites for NOAA on the other hand. Each of the orange dots are places where we have buildings that we'll be able to retrofit in the future using our partners uh, equipment and uh, and as you can see there's incredibly high alignment between the places we're going to build on top of uh, buildings and on top of industrial sites and where commercial uh, commercial sequestration opportunities will exist as well uh, again like like i mentioned on the previous slide these transportation distances are short and so we'll be able to use electrified transportation options or low carbon transportation options to help us do this transport and keep our carbon impact low <clears throat> So it's a simple three-step process that we're using. Everything from capturing CO2 to putting it underground is, is what our process is going to do to generate carbon removals. Now, we've been, we've been able to demonstrate some great traction so far with this early process as it is right now. We've got a, a couple of great uh, carbon removal offtake partners that we've already announced. And we have some great early partnerships with large commercial real estate firms that collectively own about 160 buildings in the United States. We have many others in the pipeline and we're excited to continue growing this path of potential buildings that we're gonna be able to retrofit in the future. Now, from where, we're, where we are now to how we, how we get there, is, uh, it's, been a, it's been a pretty quick process that we are continuing to pick up steam on. Last quarter, or <clears throat> excuse me, last year, uh, we were working on doing benchtop testing of our solid material and everything about it to understand its function, kinetics, energetics, and and uh, how we can plan to build a system around it. We started at the beginning of this year doing prototype system level testing with uh, with a cooling tower we purchased and different iterations of what our uh, what our what our process may look like, and that is setting us up for being able to build our first full scale pilot of this direct air capture technology by the end of this year. So we're excited about everything that we have on here and, and excited about the opportunity to deliver these carbon removals at scale. Thank you for, for listening a bit about, uh, listening to a bit about Noya and, and what we're up to. You can see my contact information here and I'm really excited to be able to start delivering carbon removals at scale to help the planet reach carbon negativity. Thank you. Hello, I'm Amy Ruddock and I look after Europe and the Middle East for carbon engineering. Thanks for welcoming me today. We'll hear over the course of the summit the need for billions of tons of removals and DAC products. Today we're at Base Camp 1. Rapid ascent is required to deploy. The IEA speaks of 32 megatons of average deployment needed per year between now and 2050 to meet its net zero scenario. Carbon engineering was founded in 2009 with the ambition of providing climate relevant scale direct air capture. I'll talk today about how we're beating that challenge through technology, business models and partnerships. From our pilot plant built in 2015, we gained six years of operational data. We're technology licensors. We can't solve climate change alone. So we've decided to partner with those that have experience of large infrastructure projects um, with transport and storage of, uh, of carbon dioxide. In the US, our plant development partner is 1.5. We're busy engineering this commercial scale direct air capture plant. Construction is expected to start in 2022 in the Permian Basin. And the plants, when fully operational, will be capable of extracting a million tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere each year. Oxy Low Carbon Ventures, 1.5's parents, recently made a public presentation to their investor community about plans to build 70 to 135 of these large scale plants by 2035. The US is a blueprint. In the UK, we're working with Storega to deploy a large scale plant in Northeast Scotland. And in Norway, the carbon removal, focusing on the Colson's region where Northern Lights is based. In Canada, we're working with Huron Clean Energy and Oxy Low Carbon Ventures on a prefeed for 100 million litres per annum direct air capture to fuels plant and targeting operations in 2026.
Our technology is based on four principles. We use existing equipment, which has been tested for decades for other purposes and has existing supply chains. We use a commodity solvent with an existing supply chain again. We use continuous closed loops, which means no, low wastage and no batch processing. And our entire technology is operating in ambient conditions. But nobody explains it better than our founder, David Key. There's no fundamental mystery about capturing CO2 from the air. There have been commercial processes for most of the last century. What's hard is to figure out how to do it at climate relevant scale at low cost. The challenge of making DAC cheap is that there isn't much CO2 in the air. So whatever your technology, you must bring an immense amount of air through your system, bringing it into contact with whatever is removing the CO2 from the air. Here's why we love our liquid system. Our contactor is adapted from industrial force draft cooling towers, a technology that's evolved over more than a century as the cheapest way humanity has developed for bringing huge volumes of air in contact with liquid coated surfaces. This industrial heritage is why we are confident in engineering our first commercial plant to remove a million tons per year. Real world air doesn't just have CO2, it has dust, chemical impurities, our liquid contactor automatically and easily manages all those impurities. This isn't theory. We know it works because the industrial cooling towers on which our system is based routinely operate for decades in dusty, polluted environments with low maintenance costs. A liquid-based contactor runs continuously. No cycling, self-cleaning, and inherently low energy. Cheap. The plastic packing that is the heart of our contactor costs about $1 per square meter of surface area. And existing supply chains allow us to quickly build millions of tons per year of capture capacity. Our system has modularity exactly where we want it. Our contactor, the thing that must be huge in any DAC system, is inherently modular. The CE design gets to take advantage of all the benefits of modular mass production where they make sense. The back end of any DAC system, regeneration, gas cleanup, and compression, must deal with high volume chemical flows. These systems don't want to be modular. Instead, they want to take advantage of the volumetric scaling laws that have driven engineering practice for more than a century. In our liquid DAC platform, the contactor takes full advantage of modular construction, while the regeneration unit takes full advantage of volumetric scaling laws. We get the best of both worlds. Just to visualize what David Keith is saying, our technology is modular with economies of scale where it makes sense. Where does it make sense? In the centralized processing facility where equipment is used today for large volume processing in other industries. So from technology to deployment, our entire approach is based on that fitness to climb that mountain. I've spoken about licensing. We're engineering standard plants, design one, build many. We and 1.5 are working with a group of visionary vendors in the supply chain, those who will scale with us. Carbon Engineering's Innovation Center in Squamish, which you can see in the picture, is where we innovate and provide updates for insertion into commercial facilities worldwide. By working with 1.5 and territory partners, we can support multiple parallel projects with local expertise. So the technology is ready. To finance plants, we need offtake. And that offtake is being sourced in compliance and voluntary markets. In the voluntary market, March marks a milestone in the scale of offtake. 1.5 announced the sale of 400,000 tonnes of carbon removal credits to Airbus. In compliance markets, we see strong market signals of carbon prices particularly within the transportation decarbonization. With several markets pricing carbon at $400 or more, and with total volume within those markets of over 100 megatons. This bar should be treated as a lens on the price markets are supporting. Whilst the pricing is clear, in some cases, direct air capture to fuel is eligible. In others, direct air capture and sequestration would be too. To realize the potential of direct air capture, 
to start to climb that mountain, integration into compliance markets is key. It will require robust certification, the setting of targets, and in some cases, the support for first of a kind installations. We're at Basecamp 1. The peak is achievable if we plan for, support, and legislate for that rapid ascent. Thank you very much to Climeworks for inviting me and Carbon Engineering to the Direct Air Capture Summit once again. We really look forward to engaging once again with the community. We're ready to face that ascent. Collaboration will be key. Thank you. Good day, everyone. I'm Hans de Neve. I'm the founder and CEO of Carbion Company. Um, and like Climeworks and many others, we are developing new technology to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. It goes without saying, I think that we face a huge problem. Um, and I'm really happy. Um, and I think you are as happy with me that IPCC also, the International Energy Agency has recently recognized the importance of direct air capture in order to mitigate climate change. Um, there are, of course, many other techniques, but now direct air capture also deserves its place among these other techniques. Of course, there is still a huge challenge that together all of us need to face, and that is the costs of this technology. Um, as long as these costs remain 500 euro per ton or higher, uh, this will not play a major role in uh, mitigating climate change. So I think we need to work, of course, on the operational expenses, energy consumption, but also on the capex expense, the cost of the machine. And that's also the reason why we started Carbion in an attempt to lower these costs further. Um, we're developing a piece of equipment which very much looks like what you see on this uh, picture here. So it looks a bit like a chimney. Um, it's a reverse chimney, so capturing air on the top and filtering out uh, the CO2 and then uh, leaving out the CO2 depleted air in the bottom. The idea is to make smaller units of, say, 100 ton um, uh, per uh, device that can work in a standalone uh, way. Such units can then be produced at mass scale, can also be transported at mass scale to make uh, larger units. Uh, and eventually scaling to gigaton uh, size uh, capturing of, of CO2 uh, worldwide. If you look at the uh, insides, let's say, of the machine, a cross section, if you want, uh, so it, it consists actually of a, of a rotating uh, a drum inside, uh, a drum that rotates in a two chamber system. On the left, there is an air, just, uh, an air uh, uh, chamber where CO2 uh, adsorption takes place. On the right, there is a CO2 desorption. Uh, it's a thermal cyclic process uh, using uh, uh, amines uh, as a technology. Um, it's a continuous process, so the drum is rotating continuously through two slits, slit openings at the, at the, at the top and the bottom on your picture uh, here. And the drum itself, it consists of um, a clot of activated carbon uh, fibers, uh, so it has a huge internal uh, surface area, so it has roughly 300,000 square meter of surface area per square meter of uh, drum. Uh, and as it is uh, very thin, also the pressure drop of air passing through is extremely low in the range of about 200 uh, Pascal. And this material can also react very fast. The key of this technology is that the reaction takes place really fast, so we do a short cycle process of um, let's say uh, half a minute adsorption, half a minute uh, desorption. So the drum rotates at a speed of roughly one rotation uh, per minute. Some details about the clot. So I mentioned it consists of uh, fibers of activated carbon. So here you see a, a, a picture uh, of one of these fibers. So the fibers themselves have about five micron in diameter. They can be woven or they can be um, in a felt uh, configuration. And so from the outside, it looks like a black piece of, uh, of uh, textile, if you want. Uh, individual fibers so are highly porous, and we functionalize the amines by means of uh, atomic uh, layer deposition on the inside of these uh, fibers. We're a small team right now, um, 13 people, very science uh, uh, and engineering heavy, obviously. 
but we work in, a, in an uh, ecosystem in the south of the Netherlands, in Eindhoven, which is an ecosystem that uh, has a lot of knowledge about thin film technology. Think about uh, research institutes like TNO, which is where I come from. Uh, also the Differ Institute, various universities in Eindhoven, but also beyond, like the University of Antwerp and, and Ghent in Belgium. And also the region is very well known for its high manufacturing, uh, high tech manufacturing capabilities. So it hosts companies like Philips, of course, but also ASML and many other companies that have specialized in the manufacturing of uh, deep uh, tech equipment. And it's also thanks to this collaboration uh, between all these stakeholders, so the academic stakeholders and the uh, machine uh, building stakeholders that we hope to make contribution to a more cost effective uh, machine to capture CO2 from uh, air. In terms of roadmap, um, I think um, we've proven the principle of, um, let's say, applying A mines by means of atomic layer deposition. Um, we're right now working towards a lab scale uh, prototype that will be roughly tier L5, should be raised by the end of this year, roughly by maybe beginning of next year, around that time frame anyway. Um, and so the first outdoor pilot machine uh, should be ready by end of uh, 2023. First commercial machines uh, will not be sold until uh, beginning of uh, 2025. So that's roughly the roadmap. So this is still in R&D phase. I would say we cannot ship these um, uh, machines today. But of course, uh, together with other companies in the DAC community, we strongly believe that this technology can make a contribution to uh, mitigating uh, global climate change. Uh, I think we all have the same goal. Uh, we're all in the same uh, game here. Uh, and uh, so I share your ambition and uh, many thanks for uh, your attention. And uh, let's go for the future. Many thanks. Hi there, my name is Peter Reinhardt and I am co-founder and CEO here at Charm Industrial. And I'm really excited today to tell you about how we are putting oil back underground. Now, that may sound a little odd, so let me explain what that means. So we are taking CO2 captured by row crops, so plants like corn stover and sugarcane bagasse, wheat straw, rice, rice straw. Uh, we're also taking CO2 captured by trees uh, in forests. Um, and we're taking the residues of these row crops, the residues of forestry operations, so things like the corn straw that gets bailed up, things like fuel load reductions that help prevent forest fires in the mountains uh, in, in the US. Um, we take those residues and we bring them into our fast pyrolyzer, which basically cooks down those sources of biomass waste residues into a liquid bio oil. And that bio oil is not really an oil, it's more like, uh, very liquid carbon sludge uh, in the sense that it's not very energetic, uh, but it has really high carbon content. And so we then take that really high carbon content liquid and we can do a couple of things. We can drive it down the road to an injection well where we can inject it deep, deep underground and sequester it. And what's really wonderful about bio oil is it actually solidifies and at downhole temperatures, it actually solidifies quite quickly. So within a matter of days or weeks, uh, you have solid carbon, deep, deep underground, sequestered far away from the biosphere, far away from the atmosphere. Uh, the other thing that we can do with the bio oil, which we won't talk much about today, is we can take it to a direct reduced iron steel plant and gasify it to make uh, green steel, uh, which is an exciting pathway. But today we'll focus on carbon removal. For a long time, people have been trying to use bio oil as a fuel. So they've been trying to use it for decades as uh, a way to make effectively a green crude oil. Um, the, the challenge with that, again, is that the energy density of bio oil is, is not very good. It's about one third of the energy density of crude oil. And so pretty much all of the efforts to try to make those into fuels have, have not succeeded. So what's weird about what we're doing uh, is that we're injecting it underground. And so that's really where we've started and focused a lot of our early de-risking. Uh, and then we, of course, are focused on scale up. So we have taken a very incremental approach to delivery, starting with purchasing third party bio oil and injecting that deep underground. That's how we've been starting to do deliveries. And it's a way to really understand what's going on in the subsurface. Uh, we're also purchasing third party pyrolyzers and uh, we'll begin operating those later this year. 
that'll be our first ability to expand uh, capacity. And then of course, in parallel, we're doing all these things in parallel, we are uh, building our own pyrolyzers fit for purpose to come down the cost curve and eventually build a whole fleet of mobile pyrolyzers that can produce bio oil very, very cheaply. So I'll go through each of these. Uh, on the injection side, very proud of our progress. Uh, last year, we delivered 5,450 tons of CO2 equivalent removals uh, ahead of schedule in our first year. Uh, we delivered the Stripe contract in uh, 416 tons in March of last year. We delivered the Shopify's 1,000 tons over the summer uh, and Microsoft's uh, as well. Um, so really proud of how fast we've been able to get some initial carbon underground and start to learn about what's going on in the subsurface and uh, start to just prove that this method really, really works. Uh, we also in parallel, of course, have been developing our own pyrolyzer. Uh, this is a shot of some corn stover in the foreground and the charm pyrolyzer in the background. We never showed this picture before, so I'm excited to show it today. Uh, this is in Kansas, uh, a bit east of Wichita. And I'll sort of back out and give you a broader view of the site here. Uh, on the right is six foot round bales of corn stover that we are grinding up in the biomass skid. That's what you see in the center back there. And that biomass gets converted into really, really small particles of, of, of biomass, about you know, a few millimeters. And then we load that into the pyrolyzer, which is the 40 foot shipping container shown here with uh, the Charm logo on it. And in there, we heat it up without oxygen and it decomposes into a solid char and a liquid bio oil. And the solid char and ash goes back on the field, closes the nutrient loop, ensures that uh, it's a really sustainable practice for the biomass that we're removing. And then we also get out this liquid, liquid carbon, this bio oil or, or carbon sludge, if you will. And that's what uh, goes down the well. So again, this is our R&D machine, uh, first deployment um, in Kansas, and really excited about the progress that we're making on R&D here towards our own purpose-built, fit-for-purpose uh, machines that we will be scaling up into a fleet over time. In terms of cost curve, uh, today we're probably around the $600 a ton on the far left here. Uh, and as you can see, most of the cost uh, for that $600 a ton is dominated by the CapEx for the, the pyrolyzer itself. Uh, with a big chunk, that's the orange part, and then a big chunk also for the biomass, cost of biomass, which is the green part down below. Uh, over time, we expect that the cost of the machine and the capex for the machine on an amortized per ton basis will basically pancake. And the reason is that uh, you know the first machines are built, hand-built by the mechanical engineers that designed them here in San Francisco, uh, which is a very expensive way to build machines. Uh, and over time, we will have a uh, proper factory where we're mass manufacturing these things. Uh, and we also expect the lifetime will increase from something like six months to something more like seven years. The cost of capital will go from something like 40% to something like 8%. And so all three of those factors and some others basically cause the cost, of, cost of, the, of the capex of the equipment to really dramatically decline from the left here uh, to the right as we deploy more and more of these pyrolyzers. Uh, the cost of the biomass is uh, also untenably high, and it really depends on uh, how far you move it. So biomass gets expensive because you touch it. Uh, and if you can avoid touching it, then it's not that expensive. So, um, you know, we're starting at a pad that is, uh, you have to move the biomass to that. You have to windrow it, you have to bale it, you have to stack it, and then you have to transport it. And so that's what drives on the far left here, the total cost of biomass, somewhere between 90 and $120 a ton. The next step down between 10 and 250 pyrolyzers is when we plan to operate at the field edge. So this is, uh, you know, you don't need to transport the bales, you just need to stack them on the edge of the field. This reduces the cost of biomass to something like $65 a ton. And then around 500 pyrolyzers, we expect somewhere in there to actually operate on field, uh, operate on field like a combine harvester, actually moving across the field, converting the biomass uh, as we go. And so in that model, you actually dramatically reduce the cost because you're eliminating windrowing, you're eliminating bailing, and you're eliminating stacking, which are all expensive operations. And then last, we expect over time that the nutrient replacement value of the ash and char that we're putting back in will continue to decrease the biomass, likely beyond even what's, what's shown here. So that's really what's driving our long-term cost curve. Uh, we believe in the long run, we can get this down to somewhere uh, under $50 a ton. Uh, and uh, really excited about the billions of tons, many billions of tons of biomass 
uh, that exists all around the world that, that can be put towards uh, this process. And then lastly, uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification is a super important topic for all carbon removal. Um, since we have actually started deliveries, this is maybe even more important. Uh, all of our deliveries to date have been buyer verified, uh, but we are very actively working on uh, first a white paper uh, for a protocol for measurement, reporting, and verification of bio oil sequestration with eco engineers. Uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, we have a public registry uh, where we actually show every single delivery that we've uh, announced and made. Uh, you can drill into that and see when it was purchased, when it was removed. And over time, we'll be showing a lot more detail here as well. Uh, all of this is building towards a public registry uh, that will be tied to a protocol which we're developing and will eventually be tied to third party verification. Uh, and so with that, uh, thank you for having us and uh, please support us in helping put more oil back underground. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Dr. Nicholas Chadwick and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Mission Zero Technologies. Mission Zero Technologies was created with this perspective that we want to proliferate in the world, this idea that we can have this new perspective on climate change. Sure, our CO2 emissions are slowly baking us to death, and you only need to look at the heat waves that are occurring all over India at this moment in time to understand how bad it can really get. But it's our contention that CO2 could be the carbon backbone of a future economy. And if we take this mindset, if we look at the atmosphere all around us, there are actually billions and billions of reserves of CO2 and carbon for us to pillage, plunder, and use as much as we like over the next 30, 50, 60, 100 years, and only derive environmental benefit from doing so. It's literally the only resource I can think of on Earth that we display this kind of relationship. So it would be stupid not to. And we think direct air capture is the best way to access that reserve. Now, at Mission Zero, we do R&D differently. Lithium-ion batteries, solar photovoltaics, and LCD screens are all proliferated, well-scaled, and well-understood technologies, and we find them almost everywhere now. But they took about 60 years to scale, from lab all the way through to market adoption, to the point now where they're almost in everything. But we don't have 60 years to wait to fight climate change. By 2030, we need to have at least 100 megatons of um, direct air capture installation capability online and operating. And so with that in mind, Mission Zero takes a very different, different focus to the way that we develop technologies and how We don't focus so much on Blue Skies research without focus. And this is essentially a university research model, which you see being used uh, all over the world to create technology companies. This is a little bit aimless, it's non-targeted, and there's no specific market outlook. We utilize experience and mistakes from others in industries that have already gone down the scale and experience curve to scale our own technologies. So this is a focus on delivering targeted outcome and market constraint based research and development. So what does that mean? Well, billions of years ago, nature figured out how to process CO2 really efficiently. So why would we bother reinventing the wheel? If you take a deep breath in right now and then take a breath out, what happens is on the breath out, your body's respired, it's created CO2 in your blood, and your body dissolves the CO2 in your blood, which is essentially a water-based solution um, in the form of bicarbonate ions and protons, and it uses a catalyst to do this. So we adopt this simple chemistry, this, this unique chemistry that CO2 displays with water to allow us to manipulate and control CO2 in a gaseous and, uh, and, and aqueous, um, aqueous form. And so this is the reason you can breathe. It's why beer is fizzy, it's why bread rises. But that's a nice chemistry. And, but the question we have to ask ourselves when we build a technology that we can scale really quickly to remove CO2 from the atmosphere is how do we house it within an infrastructure that's already scaled and we can deliver very quickly? And so wherever possible at Mission Zero, we use scaled off-the-shelf componentry to escalate and um, achieve our goals quicker. So we do this through a continuous compact direct air capture process, which we patented and developed in-house at Mission Zero. In the first step, it looks very much like most other direct air capture approaches. There are fans, drift eliminators, uh, and a packing material. And over this packing material in the uh, inside of the air contact, we pass a solvent that we've developed. Now this solvent uh, rapidly hydrates CO2 and stabilizes it in this bicarbonate and ion proton, uh, bicarbonate ion and proton form. Um, and that's long, then stabilized long enough for us to pass it through another scaled off the shelf technology, which is used in the water purification industry every day. This is used um, to provide something like 5% of Spain's clean water every year. 
So again, there are multiple manufacturers all over the world, established supply chains, and this is a technology which we can deliver very quickly. And we've shown at Mission Zero that using this process, we think the whole end-to-end -end DAC process from capture to regeneration could be less than 500 kilowatt hours per ton using only electricity. And the CO2 format that comes out is actually 98% more purity with the other 2% being humidity. And this means it's actually very close to what's required for commodity uses. So we can actually begin to proliferate not just utilization pathways, but also sequestration pathways equally. When using renewable electricity, the net negativity comes in uh, around 98%. And we think actually the technology could be adapted one day for point source capture as well. So it's a highly agile, very adaptable technique, and it's very simple as well. We get around the fundamental constraints of direct air capture doing this because what we're doing is not spending loads of energy regenerating the material to release the CO2. We don't require waste heat, which embeds emissions into the process, damaging our life cycle analysis. And it's a very simple process in that really there are only two process units here, a couple of fans and some pumps. It's very simple. And that makes us able to deploy in a way that others cannot. So with, it, with this technology development in mind, we're now looking to proliferate the technology at a range of scales. Our first pilot plant is going to be operating in the UK, where we hope pilot turn on is going to be operating from the end of quarter one, 2023. And we're working in tandem, um, supported at least in the detail, at least in the uh, early engineering design by the British government. Um, through the Bayes Greenhouse Gas Removal Competition. And we'll be working with a sequestration partner called OCO Technology. They take the energy from waste ashes um, that uh, come from incinerators and they mix it with CO2 and some other binders to realize synthetic aggregates that are carbon negative. And we hope to actually be able to feed CO2 from the atmosphere directly into this process, not only locking CO2 away for, for thousands of years, but also enabling uh, enabling the building of people's houses at the same time because it goes to make concrete blocks. So the feed study for this is finished. Uh, we're now entering into detailed design and you know, watch this space. And our next project is Project Hajar, which we're uh, carrying out in collaboration with 4401 and Omani, a UK-based company dealing with the direct sequestration of CO2 into peridotite geological formations. Uh, project Hajar has been selected as one of 50 milestone uh, $1 million awards from the Elon Musk funded CDR X prize. Um, there are over a thousand applicants, so to be chosen as one of the 50 milestone awards is, is an honor, and we think speaks to uh, the efficacy of what we're delivering in our technology. So we'll be uh, with 4401 as part of Project Tajar, delivering a minimum of a thousand tons of CO2 net uh, removal capability per year, and this CO2 will be permanently mineralized in peridotite formations in the Al Hajar mountain range of Amar. What's better is this uh, process will all be driven by uh, low cost renewable electricity and we uh, anticipate that operations should begin from 2024. So with that in mind, I'd like to thank you for listening and uh, watch this space. There's a lot of exciting things happening. Thank you. My name is Petri Laxo and I'm the CEO at Solitaire Power. We want to make buildings as carbon sinks by capturing CO2 from building ventilation. This way we can create negative emissions in buildings, which are important in stopping the climate change. Buildings are related to 38% of global CO2 emissions. So it's a really big issue. If we turn buildings into carbon sinks, it has a huge effect on stopping the climate change. And, and when this low CO2 environment is pushed into the buildings, it will help people perform better in their jobs at the offices and it will make more profit for the companies operating in, in those offices. And it's scientifically proven that if, if the outdoor CO2 level doubles indoors, which easily happens in meeting rooms, for example, we will lose like 20% of our cognitive function. The founding story of our company is that uh, we've, the company is founded in 2016, and, and uh, our founders contacted local university professors since, since these professors wanted to capture CO2 from point sources. And, and uh, our founder, Mr. Arik Pispanen, asked them that, uh, why, why, do, why do you do that? Because it would be stupid to take it from point sources if you can take it from the air. But the professor said that there's no equipment available on the market with reasonable pricing. And Mr. Pispanen said that, well, if they have somewhat of money, he can make a delivery. And that's what happened in 2017. But soon after that delivery, uh, they found out together that the capture cost is much higher than the sales price of CO2. 
So a new business model would need to be developed. And, and after some time, Mr. Bisponen had an idea that what if we combine CO2 capturing to building ventilation, and this way we can make people perform better and do those negative emissions in buildings. And also we can utilize that CO2 in making uh, alternative fuels or synthetic fuels from air. And, and if you connect a building to a gas network, you could create synthetic natural gas, for example, in buildings and, and utilize the in existing infrastructure to uh, distribute the fuel, uh, those ones in need. 2017, 2018, we lost uh, uh, because of uh, uh, business run from Dubai. And then uh, 2019, uh, we got a seed funding from Wärtsilä. And after that, the company kind of uh, started going forward and, and we started doing R&D and, and deliveries to customers. So why are we actually doing this? Uh, it's because of the CO2 in the air is increasing and we want to lower it down because it's, it's causing the climate change. And it's affecting the nature, so it's affecting us people also. Like I already told that there, there is a high uh, relevance to uh, CO2 effect on our people. And here on the lower right, we can see the effect on us people. So we lose that 20% easily. That's backed by uh, Harvard scientists and, and also NASA and several other institutes also. And the only way to slow down the climate change is to uh, make negative emissions, which means that uh, you need to take CO2 away from the air. And it's just not enough if you limit the point sources, you need to take it from air to be able to net zero or net negative. Our solution to these challenges is the, uh, the ventilation integrated CO2 capture, which makes about 50% reduction in the building's footprint, CO2 footprint. Uh, for example, offices in, here in Finland. And this is because the average CO2 emission in a building is like 21 kilos per square meter per year. And we can capture from a ventilation around 10 kilos of CO2 uh, per year per square meter, uh, if you do it on the inlet side. Here on picture, we can see uh, three cubic meters per second of air ventilation unit that, ca that captures like 20 tons of CO2 per year from an area of 2000 square meters. And that's like a three hectares of forest as a carbon sink. And, and if you would have a, a 10,000 square meter uh, building, it would be capture like 100 tons of CO2 per year. And, and uh, yes, and, and what that green CO2 can be utilized in different applications also if you are not permanently sex training. We contribute to these three SDGs. Here we can see four different product types that we have. First one is the uh, uh, a building ventilation connected device, uh, which can lower the CO2 emissions in buildings and help people perform better. Second one is, of course, the outdoor capture. Many other direct air capture companies are also doing that. Uh, we have a modular solution that you can add one or several modules to capture tens or th th even thousands of tons of CO2 if you want. And number three is a single room problem solver, so, so that you can fix a meeting room or an office with this device, which captures the CO2 from the air uh, when people are present. And product number four is the power to X system, which can capture CO2 from air, create uh, hydrogen with an electrolyzer in it and, and synthesize, for example, a natural gas, like, like we did on, with this unit in the Dubai World Expo. Um, some traction, so company founded 2016, pilot unit 2017, then seed funding, couple of deliveries, and, and uh, first uh, air as a service, we, we closed the deal last year, in the end of last year, and uh, latest sales in January this year for a global customer to utilize the CO2 in, in, in their own factory. Development roadmap. Uh, is to focus in making capture, of course, more uh, energy efficient and higher capacity. We, of course, through the sorbent development and through mass manufacturing, and, and hoping to be a company would be positive EBITDA by 24, and, and then teaming up with uh, some other companies uh, to make global expansion in 25. <clears throat> So if we think about, we would enlarge this one ventilation connected CO2 capturing into a citywide solution, 
we could capture quite a lot of uh, uh, CO2. For example, here we have an example from Tokyo. So that if, if you put all offices in Tokyo capturing CO2 with our technology, you can capture 2.4 million tons of CO2 per year. So it starts to make a significant amount when, when you uh, apply this in a, uh, in a wider scale. Then a couple of words about the team that we have. Uh, these are also the owners of the company. We've made several uh, different startups as individuals together and, and uh, exits also on the way. There's like 15 people working at the company at the moment and, and hoping that we would almost double that by end of this year since we are looking for Series A uh, to close it during this year. Thank you for your time. Hi, everyone. Uh... Thank you, Climeworks, for giving me the opportunity to introduce Astera. Uh, our mission is to make CO2 direct air capture scalable and cost-effective and uh, restore the Earth's carbon balance. Uh, my name is Shantanu Agarwal. I'm the co-founder and chief executive officer of Astera, and it's a pleasure to speak to you all. Uh, let's first start with our history. Uh, uh, the technology which we are commercializing has its roots in the work of Dr. Bob Ferrato in Columbia University, where he was working on dual function materials to capture CO2 and regenerate methane. And uh, Sustion, our parent company, partnered with uh, Columbia University to further develop these DFM materials in 2019. And uh, as we were working on that with the expertise which we have in-house on carbon capture, we realized there might be a pathway to do direct air capture and just produce CO2 as well. So we worked on bunch of different sorbents, compositions, and identified uh, alkali metal-based sorbent, which we saw a lot of promise in. And uh, after extensive lab and bent scale work, uh, realized that this is potentially something which can be effective for DAC. We were supported through this period with uh, uh, DOE grants. Uh, we got a first grant for the DFM work, and then we got another grant from DOE in 2021 for the DAC work. So we were, thank we were thankful for that initial funding support. And then we spun out uh, Sustera in 2021 to really focus on commercializing this DAC technology and the innovation which we were able to uh, develop. And we got equity funding in 2021 as well to pursue that. And right now we are uh, designing our modular system and building our first pilot plant to really scale this. The people who are doing this, the team uh, essentially is right here on this uh, screen. Uh, my background is in commercializing technologies uh, for the last uh, 22 years I've been in the energy industry uh, and the last 10 I've been working in various energy technologies, uh, either as a, a VC investing in them or commercializing them or leading them as a manager or CEO. So uh, it's a lot of fun doing this. And with me, my co-founder and CTO, Raghubir Gupta, is, uh, uh, has been pivotal in sort of finding and building this technology. And he's got 30 years of experience in carbon capture domain, probably one of the most uh, experienced person and knowledgeable person in the field. And um, uh, he is uh, leading the charge in technology development in this, in this company and ably supported by uh, our VP of technology, Corey Sanderson, who has 12 years of experience in air products and uh, has done a lot of uh, separations and uh, uh, carbon capture processes. Raghavir, by the way, has built a thousand ton per day carbon capture facility in his past. So he's got a lot of scale up experience as well from his time in RTI. Uh, we are ably supported by Darsh, who's our VP of commercialization with experience in uh, startups and consulting. And we have a growing group of technologists, scientists, uh, chemists uh, who are uh, being added to our team to sort of make this scale up happen. Overall, we have more than 20 years of uh, more than 20 R&D projects experience in CO2 capture in the past and a bunch of technology development and research experience and commercializing experience together with it. So we are quite lucky to have a team which is well rounded in that sense. Uh, we have been fortunate to have the grant funding from DOE, which started all this. Uh, until date, we have now raised two and a half million dollars in grant funding. Um, part from DOE and part from the recent uh, XPRIZE award of one million dollars which we won as uh, one of the 15 uh, companies selected by XPRIZE. And uh, alongside that, we have funding uh, from our Series A from Breakthrough Energy Ventures and Grantham Foundation, which has been pivotal in helping us uh, run faster. And uh, we also have our customers, uh, uh, Stripe and Shopify to thank for their early commitment to help catalyze 
our carbon removal technology, which we are building for uh, selling to them uh, in the near future. Uh, so this is the technology which we're commercializing at a very high level. Um, you can see that this is a, the device is, uh, has a large fan at the top. And uh, in this particular embodiment is a square box where the walls are essentially in the box are uh, um, loaded with the sorbent material. So the walls have uh, essentially channels inside them and the channels have sorbent inside them. And the air is essentially getting sucked from the sides uh, into the center of the box and extracted from the top by the fan. So uh, lean air uh, essentially is emitted from the top and uh, CO2 normal air comes into the sides of the box and uh, gets sorbed on the adsorbent which we have in the, on the walls. So we have an adsorption step which happens continuously with the fan running. And uh, at any point we might have one or two of these modules which are shown here uh, in this particular embodiment, uh, three on each side and 12 total. So we might have one or two of these modules at any point in desorption mode and the rest on adsorption. So we'll have this cyclical uh, process going on where uh, uh, we'll continue to absorb and desorb the CO2. Uh, how are we differentiated? Uh, our biggest differentiation is our sorbent, which is a non-amine sorbent. And it's based on an abundantly available low cost capture agent, uh, which is alkali metal based. And, uh, with the help of that non-amine sorbent, uh, we've been able to catalyze it and promote it in such a way that the kinetics is quite fast. And there's a beneficial effect of moisture in ambient air on that uh, catalyst as well. So uh, we are overall able to uh, create a material which is highly durable and works in variety of ambient conditions. And is at the same time uh, leveraging existing supply chains and uh, at a low cost to be available for this DAC application. So, uh, so that is one of the pillars of our technology. The other pillar is that we have uh, uh, entirely designed our system to be run on electricity. So uh, the way we have designed it, it's such that it can handle renewable intermittency, intermittency quite well. So we want to run our system entirely on renewable energy. And uh, we have uh, patented uh, highly efficient integrated heating system, which uh, delivers the heat to the sorbent um, in the monolith structure and minimizes the heat losses. So we believe that that will allow us in the long run to be extremely efficient in terms of our delivery of and need of overall electricity and heat. And we, our kinetics is uh, uh, obviously with a low desorption energy. So we have a lower energy need overall. Lastly, we have built the system for scaling and we have uh, essentially creating these standardized modules, standardized units which are essentially you can put in multiples of to really increase the capacity of your installation to whatever level you want. So that will allow us to standardize the system and build them in, in large volumes and reduce the, reduce the cost. And at the same time, we are leveraging existing supply chains for our raw materials and our products. So we have a low capex and a low opex uh, built into our design and engineering as we are scaling the system. Our target metrics are a pathway to be less than 2000 kilowatt hours per ton CO2. And our CapEx targets are to be less than $600 per ton year. Uh, and our price at scale is gonna be less than $100 per ton of CO2. So that's what we're working towards. In terms of our cost projections, as you can see, uh, we've done a lot of detailed technical economic analysis. And based on that, we believe at uh, the, uh, the nth commercial scale, 1 million ton per annum, uh, unit, we should be less than $100 a ton. And uh, this is the journey as we go through that uh, cost reduction path, where we are scaling up the manufacturing, improving our absorption rate, improving our uh, processes and uh, sort of manufacturing a lot of these. So uh, from 100 ton per day uh, to 1 million ton per annum, we believe we can get to a cost point, which is definitely affordable by mankind to really scale DAC at uh, gigaton type of scales. This is our plan uh, for the next builds. Uh, we are working towards extracting and removing 500 million tons or half a gigaton of permanent CO2 removal by 2040. That's our first mission to really, uh, uh, in terms of quantitative removal. Uh, we have uh, obviously got a bench scale running already. We are building our pilot plant this year. And next year we'll start building our first commercial unit and hope to replicate multiple commercial units from 2023 onwards 
2024, 2025, and on. And then we hope uh, these commercial units will lead our way to build the first million ton scale unit around 20, 2027 to 2029 time period. That's all I have uh, at this point. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I hope you can join the conversation, help us uh, hire more people. We are ag aggressively recruiting and join the, the mission to uh, remove carbon from the planet uh, ecosystem and reverse the uh, carbon balance, restore the carbon balance. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Nicholas Eisenberger. I'm the president of Global Thermostat. I want to uh, thank uh, the whole Climeworks team, Jan and Christoph, and all the participants in this summit, my fellow entrepreneurs and uh, leaders in direct air capture for coming together for this important event. Uh, on behalf of my entire team, we're, we're, we're thrilled to participate uh, in this important discussion. I wanted to just take a step back and say, why are we here again? Um, what is the purpose for this third Direct Air Capture Summit? And also, you know, why are we having this more discussions about this topic? I think everybody knows the essence of this, but it's important to revisit for those who might not, or just as a call to action for us all again. As you all know, we face an ex existential climate threat. Um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is already uh, dangerously high. And we know, the science tells us, we need to remove billions of tons, maybe even a trillion tons by the end of the century from the atmosphere to address this threat. And direct air capture has a, a key role, not a sole role, but a key role to play in solving this challenge. There's a number of characteristics of direct air capture that really make it clear that it needs to be a core solution in removing CO2 from the atmosphere. It's um, right here, uh, many times more efficient than trees. I love trees, but we don't have enough land area to be able to solve the problem through biological means alone. We need biological solutions to be deployed for a whole set of reasons, including carbon removal, but we need direct air capture to play its role. And we don't have a lot of time. Last September, for the other the, the previous Climework Summit, I happened to count how many months we had between that moment and 2030, when again, the science tells us that direct air capture needs to be deployed at a very significant scale to start playing its role in addressing the climate threat. At that time, it was 100 months. Now we have 90 months. A lot of time has passed, a lot of, a lot of our percentage of time has passed in just those 10 months. Every month represents more than a percent than we have left. We have to get moving. We have to mobilize now together. And that's what this whole discussion is, is about. Let me tell you a little bit about Global Thermostat. Like many of you, we share a, an ambitious purpose to restore the Earth's climate by reducing the CO2 at a global scale for the benefit of all. And that means sustainably, equitably, and in a way that's economically beneficial. We've worked really hard over the last 10 plus years to develop a powerful solution to achieve that goal. We've tried to develop one of the most uh, cost-efficient, most scalable and most flexible technology platforms to remove CO2 from air in, in the most efficient way possible. Our business is designed to address climate. That's what it's all about. To do that, We've developed a state-of-the-art technology center in Denver, Colorado, that's really focused on how do we optimize the performance of direct air capture over time during the long haul of this fight. We also believe that we can't do this alone. We wanna have the world's best or one of the best technologies out there amongst many of you, but we know that we can't build one company to tackle the entire climate challenge. We have to work with partners. That's why we've designed our company and our business model to work with third parties around the world who have the capability to deploy plants. We also uh, believe that a licensing model using our technology advancements and our IP is the best way to get in the hands of those capable, the ability to do this. I've already developed a set of world-class partners, uh, some of whom are listed below to, uh, to start on that journey. And we've also taken steps recently uh, to really ready our company for growth and scaling, which we need to do. As we, once again, we have 90 months between now and 2030 when we need to be well on our way. So we're working hard on our technology 
uh, pathway to uh, reduce our costs in line with our vision of where we, what we can achieve and to uh, uh, scale up and deploy at a global scale. I mentioned that we are preparing for growth and scaling, and uh, some of you may have seen we uh, uh, undertook a strategic transition at the beginning of this year. Uh, we've stood up a new professional management team. Our founders have founded a uh, aligned nonprofit focused on uh, addressing the climate challenge at scale, going quicker than we are even at a commercial level can do to really push the envelope. And we've dedicated 2% of global thermostats profits to, to fund that effort. We're becoming a Delaware Public Benefit Corporation, and we're hiring uh, across our technology and commercial organizations to build a world-class team. We're also uh, really excited. We're finalizing our next generation solution at our technology center. I'll tell you a little bit more about that below. And raising capital uh, to fuel our growth. We've already done a first close, and we'll be sharing more news about that soon. Here's a quick look at our, at, uh, our terrific team that we have leading this fight. Uh, our chairman, Edgar Bronfman uh, Jr., who has been our longtime executive chairman and uh, uh, lead investor. I myself, as a longtime um, uh, investor and entrepreneur in the broader climate space, and a uh, roster of senior leaders listed here, um, some of the best uh, uh, commercial and technological leaders in the space. We've, uh, we've worked very hard to identify those who can have the, have the expertise and experience to help us scale. And we have some, uh, some of the folks on our team listed here uh, who have been uh, working on director capture longer than, than many other human beings on planet Earth. We're just so pleased and proud to have that team to help us along this journey. For the last 10 plus years, Global Thermostat has really focused on how can we, uh, using first principles, at a molecular material science level, how can we efficiently capture CO2 from air where it is obviously incredibly dilute at 400 plus parts per million. So at every level of scale, we've worked to identify what is the most capital efficient and the most uh, operational efficient and energy efficient way to do that. That has been our journey using first principles. What's the best way to do that? How does the global thermostat uh, solution work? Uh, we have a solid absorbent solution like our colleagues at, at Climeworks. And um, it's fairly simple in concept. We, we take air in, um, pass it over uh, high uh, surface area honeycomb monoliths at a high velocity with low pressure drop. And we have uh, designed those monoliths with a uh, absorbent apparatus that efficiently captures and selectively captures CO2 from the passing air. Um, we then uh, regenerate the monoliths using low temperature, widely available, low cost, low temperature heat, and the process uh, begins again. What we've tried to do at every turn is say, how can we use capital most efficiently and deploy it continuously to be able to uh, undertake this difficult task? And we believed we've achieved uh, that in, in our approach. We also uh, have a solution to uh, capture CO2 from air as well as CO2 from flue gas in, a, in, in pretty much the same capital plant, just adding flue gas at the, at the step here where the green arrow is pointing to. This uh, we think is important because we do have a widely uh, distributed trillion dollar plus fossil fuel infrastructure where, that's producing heat and power. And we can, through this solution, uh, leverage that uh, infrastructure to turn those fossil plants into carbon negative power plants. From a climate perspective, that gives us another tool in the overall climate fight. And from a commercial perspective, that broadens the, uh, the, the, the locations and the applications where we can apply our technology. Love to share a couple of the, the key milestones along our journey. Uh, we started, uh, our, did our first pilot in, uh, at SRI in Stanford in Palo Alto, California um, in 2011. We did our first uh, carburetor or director capture plus uh, uh, pilot a few years later. Um, uh, our Gen 2 plant in, uh, in 2018, and we're now pulling together our Gen 3 technology. And there's a preview uh, picture here. Uh, the core capture unit is uh, about to be placed uh, where you see that sort of skeleton 
uh, framework on the upper uh, left. And uh, uh, this is all happening real time in our, our Colorado Technology Center. We're very excited to share the news of that when it's ready. As I mentioned up front, our technology center is a, is a core uh, asset for global thermostat. And it's a um, important part of how we believe we can continue to provide um, uh, the best solution with the optimized performance at the lowest cost over time. We're parameterizing our, uh, our uh, solution on a real-time basis and capturing CO2 at various scales with a world-class team and a set of uh, capabilities there. There's been a lot of discussions about what cost we can achieve. And uh, you know, I'm not going into specific detail on global thermostat here, but it, this is a question that has uh, been around the, the direct air capture space for a long time. And I think uh, we all share the view that it's important to realize that we're just at the early stages of what uh, direct air capture industry and individual companies like global thermostat and many of you can achieve. History tells us that humanity, when it sets its mind to it on new technology, um, goes down a cost curve. And we're already close to where we need to be in the direct air capture space than solar and wind were when they started. So there's every reason to believe that we have a, a, a journey to go and we need to deploy now to go down that journey. So uh, as you, I think all agree, there's a tremendous market opportunity out here for, for us and others in this space across uh, carbon utilization and sequestration pathways. The market opportunity is truly uh, uh, ginormous and uh, it will evolve and, and, and uh, come to fruition over time. We're already seeing evidence across utilization pathways of real uh, uh, willingness to pay and desire to by major players to go down this, this road and also in the sequestration, corporate voluntary purchases and government incentives. Our strategy uh, is to really work, as I mentioned, with partners to start deploying. Uh, we have a strong track record of working with the DOE we're designing a 100,000 ton direct air capture plus facility with great partners. We have a, a, a several joint development agreements with one of the world's best engineering organizations. And we see growing opportunities across all those pathways that I mentioned before. So uh, Global Thermostat is really all about collaborating with market leaders to mobilize for climate. As I've mentioned repeatedly, we need to mobilize now together and we're doing that across all these dimensions listed here, across our technology work, to develop our supply chain, to ready ourselves for deployment, and to engage society. Just a few weeks ago, we launched with many of you and many other leaders in this space, I'm so proud to stand beside the Direct Air Capture Coalition, whose purpose is to educate, engage, and mobilize society. I hope you take a look at Direct Air Capture, DACCoalition.org, at what we're doing there, and uh, welcome the opportunity to to work with all of you and to collaborate on this uh, important fight. Thanks so much. Please get in touch anytime, Nicholas at Global Thermostat, and look forward to the further conversations. Congratulations to the companies and organizations working so hard in this space. We all need you to succeed. I hope you enjoyed watching the video and see you at Climate's Direct Air Capture Summit on June the 30th. <laughs>